Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Good morning ladies and gentlemen Welcome back to the second international conference on child friendly education today So um, we will directly begin the agenda with the plenary session 3 followed by questions and answer by Ibu Bodil Ramuson, PhD, and Professor Dr. Endang Faust, moderated by Ibu Happy Adia Tiarini, PhD. The floor is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second uh, international conference, ICCE, uh, on Sunday, uh, 22nd of April. Uh, today we have uh, three speakers here. Uh, I would like to, before we start the session today, I would like to read uh, their curriculum vitae. Uh, the first presenter is Professor Dr. Endang Fauziati. Uh, she is a lecturer in English education in uh, teacher training and education faculty, Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta. She has been teaching here since 1985. Maybe some of you have not been born yet. <laughs> And uh, she earned her doctor uh, from Universitas Atmajaya, Jakarta. And she also has diploma on child right based school management from Lund University. And her research interest is uh, applied linguistics, TEFL, child friendly education. Uh, recently, she has some publications. She has published several books in the TEFL, uh, applied linguistics, and also psycholinguistics. And right now, she's also uh, become a CRC change agent. And uh, on my uh, left side, we have uh, Ibu Bodil Rasmussen, PhD. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, she is from School of uh, Social Work from Lund University, uh, Sweden, and um, her research interest has focused on children's perspectives, methodology in research with children as informants and children's participation. And another area of interest is assessments within child welfare with special focus on methods for assessment of foster homes. And uh, her professional work, she has worked for about 20 years as social worker, counselor at secondary school, and as a local children's ombudsman in the municipality of Lund. And uh, one of uh, her publications released in 2016, entitled Realizing Child Rights in Education, Experiences and Reflections from the International Training Program on Child Rights, Classroom and School Management. Okay, uh, now we will move on to the first uh, speaker. I would like to give uh, this opportunity to Professor Endang Fauziati uh, and her paper article is UNCRC, Child Friendly School and Quality Education, Three Concepts, uh, One Goal. Time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Assalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi israhli sadri wa yassirli amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Rabbi zidni ilma, Rabbi zidni ilma, Rabbi zidni ilma, warzukni fahma wa amalan sholika. Amin ya rabbal alamin. Thank you very much Ibu Happy addressing me for the presentation today. Um, I would like to address my honorable 
uh, guest, Professor Ismail, also my dear mentor, Ibu Bodil from Lu University, and also distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for today's presentation, because uh, my paper is very basic, so I'll start with. Uh, it focuses more on uh, the concept and then followed by Ibu Bodil and also Pato Ibi will concern more on the practices. Uh, the title of my presentation is UNCRC, Child-Friendly School or Child-Friendly Education and Quality Education, Three Concept, One Goal. Many of us are quite familiar with uh, what is uh, CRC, Child Right Convention, but maybe some of us also uh, not quite familiar yet with this. Uh, it turned out to be yesterday's question dealing um, some question addressed from the, the floor. So um, the organization of my presentation, I'll start with what is UNCRC, United Nations Child Rights Convention, and followed by Child Friendly School. It is a term uh, what is it, coined by UNICEF. And then finally, I talk about quality education, especially taken from UN Sustainability, UN Sustainable Development Goal, or it's quite uh, common with uh, UN SDGs, especially Goal 4. <coughs> I'd like to uh, try to present how the relatedness among these three concepts, actually these all three concepts have one goal, that is to promote uh, the well-being of children. I'll start with the uh, convention, child rights convention. People question about what is actually convention. A uh, convention is a specific type of international law. Yes. So it is a kind of agreement or compact, especially among nations, usually created within an international organization such as United Nations. So every country must sign this convention and then ratify the convention and then of course monitor and enforce uh, the convention. What is right? When something is called right, it means that nobody can take away from us. Nobody can take away from you. It protects us because it's ours and it protects us and it helps us for having a good life. And child rights are list of promises to children and also young people to keep safe. So right is to protect us. Right to protect us and to help us to keep safe. Child rights are to make sure that children are treated fairly and looked after properly. Because in the past, especially in my childhood, I didn't uh, know anything about the right, my right. What we know is just the responsibility, you know, that the services, that the good thing that we have to do to the adult, but not the right. Who is child? Yeah, last time uh, I was also questioned by uh, some of the participants participant who is considered ch child, who are considered children. So biologically, a child is human being between stages of birth and puberty. That's uh, when we uh, have perspective on biology. And uh, in the perspective of legal, yeah, legal definition, a child generally refers to a person younger than the age of majority. And then, of course, I have to quote uh, what is children according to UNICEF, uh, especially stated in Article 1, a child is a person below the age of 18. So students who are in elementary school, kindergarten, elementary school, and also secondary, secondary school are all regarded as children, 1 to 18. Uh, of course, unless the laws of particular countries set the legal age for the adulthood younger. So next, what is UNCRC then? Nearly every country in the world has agreed to make sure that children's rights are protected by signing up the document, the treaty called UNCRC, 
Of course, Indonesia also uh, already ratified this uh, UNCRC that is on <coughs> 1990. UNCRC itself in nine, eight, uh, 1985 or something. So 15 years later, uh, Indonesian government ratified UNCRC in 1990. Thus, we have to make sure that children rights are protected. The convention changed the way children are viewed and treated as human beings with a distinct set of rights. So children have their own right. Uh, this right describes what the child needs to survive, to grow, to live up, uh, to their potential yeah. in the world. This right applies equally to every child, no discrimination no matter who they are and where they come from. So, no discrimination. Uh, the convention has 54 articles that cover all aspects of child's life. Uh, children all over the world are entitled to have civil, political, economic rights, social, as well as cultural. It also explains how adult and government must work together to make sure that all children can enjoy all their rights. The convention must be seen as a whole. All rights are linked and no right is more important uh, than another. So sometimes it is rather difficult for us to remember the 54 article of uh, child rights. So this is especially explanation from uh, Girsa well-being indicator, uh, foundations of getting it right on every chart. This is from New Zealand. So these are all the article, yeah? Successful learner, confident individual, effective contributor, responsibility citation. So uh, article 18, 20, 21, et cetera, this dealing with nurtured, yeah? 31, active respected, responsible, included, uh, safe, and healthy, and achieving. So this one of the way to, uh, what is it, to identify the indicators of the 54 article of uh, UNCRC. So in general, UNCRC call for freedom from violence. So I think that everybody questions about the beauty a lot of bullying that uh, currently happen. And also adequate nutrition, free compulsory primary education, educate healthcare, equal treatment regardless of gender, race, cultural background, the right to express opinion, freedom of thought in matter affecting them. So very often we disregard their right uh, to have uh, participation in decision making. So actually, the children have <coughs> to have uh, to participate in decision making, in dealing with everything that affect them. And then number seven, safe exposure, uh, access to leisure, so play, yeah? play, culture, art, it's also the student's right that's guaranteed by UNCRC. Uh, common approach to group the UNCRC article under four, Theme. So what is CRC? CRC is SDPP. So in order to make us easier to remember, what are the rights of the children? The rights of the children are SDPP. Survival, survival right, developmental development right, protection right, and then participation right. Uh, okay. So it also summarized by Wicker, uh, Wickenburg with three Ps. So it's quite familiar, especially among the, the uh, child right agent, yeah, change agent. What is uh, child right? What are child rights? Child rights are three Ps. So when I go to a school visit, yeah, uh, having or giving, uh, what is it, workshop, etc. apa itu hak anak? Anak adalah 3P. So I think it's very easy for 
the teacher to discern the kind of right of the children. Apa itu hak anak? Hak anak adalah 3 P and then I ask them to mention one by one. Provision, protection, participation. So what are the right of the children? Provision, protection, participation. So I think it's very easy to identify the 54 article of the children right. Next, uh, number two is start friendly school. So this is UNICEF, United Nations International Children Emergency Funds terminology that try to promote quality education among the children. So having the concept uh, child friendly education. So as child friendly educator focus on the need of the whole. So we have to view children as the whole person like what Karel Rogers say uh, viewing children as the whole person. Health, nutrition, offer, uh, overall well-being, care about what happened to children in their family and their community before they enter school and of course after uh, they leave. Uh, Child-friendly school implies designing world-class school that inspire a love of learning and create a sense of harmony among school, family, environment, and community. So three, uh, what is it, milieu, that is the family, uh, school, and also community. Child-friendly school promote healthy, safe, protective environment for children's <clears throat> emotional, psychological, physical, so the whole aspect not only physical but as well as emotional and uh, psychological. Uh, UNICEF has developed a framework for right-based, we call it right-based uh, school management or child-friendly educational system and school uh, with the seven pillar. The first pillar, including every child, so no discrimination, um, does not include, does not discriminate stereotype on the basis of differences. So any children, no discrimination, all are included. It provides free compulsory education. Number two, a child center school. So of course, new paradigm. In the past, more uh, teacher teacher centered but the child friendly education concerned with child center so the children become the center of education acting at the best interest of the child to realize the child's full potential respecting diversity effective for learning so when children come to school they have to be happy yeah happy happy in learning so they want to learning, they are motivated, not discouraged. Healthy and protective children, gender sensitive, no stereotype, and also teamwork. Teamwork dealing with three components of education, uh, family, school, and uh, community or environment. Uh, so the last is UNSDGs, uh, United Nations Sustainable uh, development goal. In September 2015, United Nations ratified 17, 17 goal, a sustainable development goal. So especially goal four, goal for state quality education. So US, uh, uh, UN SDGs uh, try to serve a kind a bench as a kind of a benchmark for every nation to ensure global prosperity oh my lord global prosperity protections of the planet and eradications of poverty building on the principle leaving no one behind the new agenda emphasizes a holistic approach to achieving sustainable development for all so these are the 17 goal of uh, us uh, sdgs number one no poverty 
uh, what is it, zero hunger, good health, quality education. So I'm going to focus especially on uh, quality education because I work in, uh, what is it, educational institution, and then gender quality, clean water and sanitation, etc., etc. So 17 goals. Goal number four is quality education. What is quality education? Uh, US NDG, UN, SDGs, goal four, uh, quality education state, ensure inclusive, inclusive, e equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning. And then the question, what is quality education then? Some say that quality education is threshold level of quality education, especially on literacy, numeracy at all. That is very uh, popular with three R. Uh, arithmetic, uh, reading, writing, yeah, arithmetic, reading, writing, three R, so threshold level. Uh, the UN SDGs recognizes that uh, this definition is insufficient and outdated. Education is a system designed to help all children reach their full potential and enter society as full and productive citizen. So I think it's uh, very much influenced by Karel Rogers' humanism theory of how we perceive uh, children as human beings, as a whole person who have potential to grow. So our duty as a dad is to cater, to facilitate the growth of the children. Uh, and a broad concept, this is from UNESCO. What is quality education? Uh, a broad concept of UNESCO. Uh, 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 okay, so quality education, uh, pertinent, oh my god. Okay, so this is from UNESCO, pertinent, relevant, efficacy, efficiency, uh, and also equity. Uh, now this is from UNICEF, this is from UNESCO and then from UNICEF. There is a consensus exists around the basic dimensions of quality education today. As a system, quality education should continually assess and improve all dimensions of system of quality. So there are five dimensions of quality education. That is number one, quality learner. We very often disregard uh, when talking about quality, edu quality education focuses more on the process, on the input and the output, but actually there are five uh, that we have to have uh, great concerns on quality education. Quality learners, quality environment, quality content, quality process, and quality outcomes. Uh, quality learners. Okay, so when we visited uh, sc schools in uh, Sweden, uh, they really cater the quality learners of children in school. So aspect of health, yeah, children who have health, of course, uh, covering health physically, psychologically, mentally, and also emotionally, and then early childhood experience is a very important role in providing the basis for healthy life and successful formal schooling. Positive early experience are also vital to preparing the quality learner. Healthy children with positive early learning experience and supportive homes are the most likely to succeed in school. So that's why education starts from home. Uh, number two, family sport. Number three, family sport. Parents may have uh, no background to support their uh, children's cognitive and psychological development throughout their school years. Thus, 
parental education is crucial since it influences parent-child interaction related to learning. So that's why, and uh, what is it? In our community, we have PKK group that only focuses more on nutrition, but I think also it's better if we provide education for the parent. Uh, and uh, the last is intrinsically motivated. Children love learning. Children who are healthy, uh, children who are healthy mentally, psychologically, emotionally, they are happy learning. They are happy in school. So they are motivated to learn. Number two is quality learning in environment. It's consistent for physical, psychological, and also service delivery element. Physical learning environment ranging from relatively modern and well-equipped building, etc. The environment must be designed to support all children in their learning process, not only for children, but as well as to support teachers and also uh, education, sport personnel to work, to uh, do their job. Psychological, uh, psychosocial, psychosocial element, peaceful, safe environment, especially for girls. So girls should be uh, treated rather differently because of their uh, physical condition. Um, welcoming and non-discriminatory climate and critical to creating quality learning environment. Uh, the school service environment, provision of health services and education can contribute to learning, especially reducing absenteeism and inattention. Six children cannot attend school well. Three is quality content. Quality content may include relevant curriculum and the teaching material. Curriculum should be student-centered non-discriminatory and standard base. The curriculum must highlight basic life skills, which include such topics as health, hygiene, etiquette, or uh, character building, knowledge about its IV, AIDS, you know, peace education, um, uh, gender equality, yeah, and other important things that is considered uh, nationally or internationally issues. Uniqueness of local and national content. The specific content depends on local and national values. In the main subjects areas, primary education may include language, math, science, um, and also social studies. Quality process reverse to how teachers and administrators use input to frame meaningful, so I put it in bold, meaningful learning experience. Maybe it's inspired by uh, Oshubal, what is meant by meaningful learning, meaningful learning experience, uh, especially for the students. Uh, in school context, it may mean the quality of children's experience in school with a focus on the process rather than final output. So in the past, the, uh, what is it, the old paradigm uh, focuses more on the product, but uh, the new paradigm focuses more on process, product, process process but it doesn't mean product it's not important this uh, also uh, quality process also include the children happiness and security as indicator of the quality of education provided uh, by a school thus the good quality teachers are those who are capable of helping their students to learn so our job our duty in school helping them, not giving them punishment, but helping them to grow. That's quality teachers. Quality process is commonly founded on the principle that good people working with sufficient resources and according to good processes will produce good results, but that faulty processes 
will prevent even good people and plentiful resources from producing optimal outcome. Quality process. Uh, the last, quality learners. Um, quality outcome, quality learners outcome are uh, the expected result. Expected result, of, of course, as a whole person, we have to view it on how, yeah, what they can do, especially the knowledge, attitude, so um, the three aspects, attitude, knowledge, and also skill, and the expectation they have for themselves and their society. Key educational outcome, achievement related to literacy, that I uh, mentioned previously, dealing with 3R. Uh, and other achievement, of course, related to community participant and learner confidence, and hence life skill. So life skill is very important. And the capability to make responsible choice and resolve conflict. So I think it's very Rahman, relevant to this uh, condition where about their hygiene. So school feeding program to improve nutrition, curricular content that improve their knowledge treated to health and hygiene. In Sweden, all the children uh, are provided with food, especially for lunch and for free. Uh, the last life skill outcome, psychosocial and interpersonal skill can be applied to health contexts such as HIV, etc., and also abuse prevention, nutrition, and hygiene behavior, and many non health extension. Conclusion Education is a basic human right and a significant factor in the development of children, community, and countries. It is intrinsically linked to all development goals as UNSDGs, such as supporting gender empowerment, improving child health and well-being, reducing hunger, fighting the spread of HIV, spurring economic growth and building peace. Therefore, every country has identified the improvement of quality education as one of their topmost national priorities, UNCRC. Child Friendly School and Quality Education, US and DG's num, uh, num four, goal four, um, are concepts which are designed to guarantee that children all over the world has access to quality education. Children are citizens of their own. We have to underline this. Children are citizens of their own, entitled to full spectrum of human rights including the right for quality education. UNCRC becomes the principle of which child-friendly school or child-friendly education is developed. Five dimensions, we have to remember the five dimensions of quality, quality education, including quality learner, quality environment, quality content, quality process, and quality outcome. Ah, I like this, <laughs> this from Bordil. I want to uh, read for you from Dorothy Law Holt. A child, if a child lives with criticism, see he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, see or he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, See or he learns 
too shy. If a child lives with shame, she or he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, she or he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, she or he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, she or he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, she, he, she or he learns justice. If a child lives with security, she or he learns to have faith. If a child lives with approval, she or he learns to like himself. To build self-concept. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, she or he learns to find love in the world. From Dorothy Law. I got it from my mentor, Bodil. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your attention. Semoga bermanfaat bagi kita semua to promote our well-being of the children. Akhiru kalam, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Ibu Endang Fauziati, who has enlightened us with uh, the three concepts. Uh, she has uh, generously explained about the concept as well as giving examples and also wrap up with uh, beautiful uh, wise words at the end. Uh, now we will continue to the next presenter, uh, Ibu Bodil Rasmussen and Bapak Toibi. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um, I hope everybody has read uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child um, and for uh, Indonesian participants I think uh, it is also a must that you read um, the Indonesian law on the child protection <coughs> um, our president uh, the following presentation will be very different from what has been presented by Professor Indang. Uh, Professor Fauziati uh, was more uh, theoretical and uh, to some extent also uh, abstract proposition. Like, uh, uh, for example, when we read uh, the, United, uh, the United Nations Convention or the law on the child protection, we may have uh, um, a sense that uh, they are uh, clear enough. But when we come to the implementation, then problem begins. So that's why in the following presentation, we are going to share with you our experience in implementing the child rights or the CRC. Um, we derive our uh, experience from three different countries. The first is from South Africa. The second is from Zambia. And the third is from Indonesia. So I would like uh, uh, Budil to begin with the presentation, uh, sharing our experience in implementing uh, the CRC in uh, South Africa and also in Zambia. Later, I will 
give some um, uh, highlight on the implementation of problems in implementing the CRC in Indonesia. Okay, uh, Budil, uh, please begin the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fosia. Thank you, Toibi. Uh, I am happy to be back again to give you some more glimpses from what I talked about yesterday. I talked about projects, I talked about work for change, I talked about successes in our international training program, child rights, classroom and school management. But we didn't go into the concrete reality or children's everyday life for showing what these results really mean in practice. So I think it's, it's good to live in a world with all the good visions described by Fosia here. We have the goals, we have the visions, but there is a gap, of course, between theory and practice. How could we make reality of all the beautiful worlds? I have had uh, the privilege to travel around in many countries to learn about how it could be practiced. As I told you yesterday, I have been the mentor for teams from Indonesia uh, for about 10 years. I have also been the mentor for teams from South Africa and Zambia which means that I have visited these countries many times. And I have uh, visited many schools, talked with many children, teachers, parents, and so on. So um, we can, I will give you some glimpses. Uh, yeah. Zambia is in the southern part of Africa and it looks like this on the map. It has nine provinces and one of them is Copperbelt and another one is Lusaka where the capital city is placed. So in those two provinces we have worked with our training program. Uh, Zambia is a very poor country uh, with about 16 million inhabitants and with a very young population, 50% between 0 and 14 years. There, uh, we have trained uh, the same number of change agents as here in, uh, in Indonesia. We have 31, most of them then from Copperbelt and Lusaka. Uh, when the project started, about 10 years ago, there were a lot of problems identified by the change agents who wanted to go in to do something on children's rights. There were bad relationships between teachers and students without mutual trust. Uh, yeah, it could happen that teachers didn't come to the, to the lessons and uh, yeah, there were no respect in many ways. Uh, the atmosphere was unruly, the marks were poor, and the premises filthy. Corporal punishment was commonly used. There were riots among students because they were not satisfied, vandalism and aggressive behavior, and students had no say. They didn't uh, participate in anything in the classroom or in the school environment. So what did the change agents start with? Yes, they had to start with creating awareness on children's rights. They decided to focus on children's participation and democratization of the schools. They thought that that would be the key to change. So they started with organization of school councils, uh, which you recognize in Indonesia as OSIS, um, but they also started in, uh, at lower level um, uh, with these school councils. Um, and uh, this is something then that has developed very much during the years. Um, so besides that, they also worked very much on uh, networking and development of structures for dissemination and sustainability with focus on children's participation. Networking in the, among students, media, you can take that photo, uh, 
networking among students. They invited students to come together in workshops, discussing on how to solve the problems, on how to develop democracy, how, on how to develop participation. Uh, this is a, a photo from a school council with the girls in a primary school. It, they learned that it was also, could also be successful to work with the younger children. And here is a chairperson and a secretary handling the, the whole thing in the meeting. And that meeting was especially interesting because they were talking about should we allow boys to come to our school or not? What do you think? Is that something that children should, uh, should be involved in? Have part in decision making on things like that? Yeah, they thought so. They were very eager to discuss. And these girls, they were very occupied with talking about the school uniform. They wanted something else. They wanted other colors. They wanted another style. Yeah, that could be another thing they were interested in participate on. Cultural activities uh, shouldn't be underestimated as a way for participation. Uh, sometimes it is uh, criticized to be a kind of decoration, um, not and without any deeper meaning of participation. But in uh, this case, in, in Zambia, they have a lot of different cultural dances, like you have here in Indonesia. And uh, it is an important thing to, for their development to take part in this kind of activities. So results came rather quickly. It was more or less like turning the hand. It has been amazing to experience the change, how the atmospheres in schools have totally changed. I have heard many stories about that there are no more riots and vandalism. Corporal punishment has stopped improvement of performance, upgrading of the infrastructure in schools. And Toby has actually been with me in Copper Belt to witness some of this. Oh, what is it? <laughs> we have a child here. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, perhaps you should go back to the other one. Uh, yeah. yeah, it has to be stressed that it is because of children's participation that these changes have been able to achieve. Uh, the, the program has been evaluated by an external evaluator. So these points are actually taken from that report. Uh, she visited uh, some schools and talked with many students about what has happened through the projects. Corporate punishment is deeply rooted in African schools. I think you also have corporate punishment in Indonesian schools. It is something that could be very difficult to change, but it has been possible. Uh, you can think you, you skip that one. Uh, let us go to South Africa. It is very similar conditions uh, as in Zambia. But uh, as I mentioned yesterday, implementation of children's rights uh, uh, varies with the context. South Africa is still struggling with the consequences of the apartheid system that ended 1994 when South Africa became a democracy. The apartheid system meant that colored, black and white people were strictly separated from each other and there was a special school system for black children and they li lived in separate areas with a very bad education bad quality many times and 
the country and the society is still working on building the democracy and the society. And that is something that has yeah, uh, been the reality when the projects here should be implemented. Uh, it has also a young population, a big population, not compared to Indonesia of course, but 53 million inhabitants and 19 million children. Yeah. Uh, when the project started, there were much worries for vulnerable children growing up in very poor areas with high unemployment rates, drug abuse and violence. Mo many children live like this. There are many efforts taken by the government to change. So there are also, of course, other kind of uh, housing areas, but still many live this way. Uh, so the three Ps that you have heard been mentioned many times was the point of departure for the projects, much on support to orphans and child-headed households, their provision in many cases. They didn't have uh, food, they didn't have shoes, uh, they didn't have their basic needs fulfilled. Uh, to call for the parents to, to come to support in schools was also something that has been worked with. Uh, drug abuse, sexual abuse and rape, corporal punishment, teenage pregnancies are other problems that were focused. And also here, children's participation, both in classrooms and school management. The three Ps. Yeah, you can see it has really been used as a tool for understanding and uh, work on, on change uh, the way it has been defined. Uh, the, on the t-shirts of the children coming back, all could talk about the three Ps. And the parental involvement, yeah, it, it took place in different ways. Uh, one of the projects or two of the project schools identified certain problems when it came to contacts with the parents. The parents didn't come to school more, more than uh, twice a year perhaps and then or if they came more often they came because there were problems with their children. So and the attitude from the school was not very positive to the parents and the parents didn't like to come very very much. But the, the projects, the change agents, they started to invite the parents in a new way. So this was one way for their participation to come to school and perform together with children. And to uh, to support in in uh, distribution of the school meals and to uh, take part in, uh, in creation of school gardens uh, to grow their own vegetables for the school meals and for uh, giving in packages to the orphans or poor children for the weekends. So it's also something that has spread uh, through some pilot projects. And Child-friendly classrooms, child-friendly schools are also used as concepts in South Africa. Uh, so changes of children's participation in the classrooms, uh, different uh, new pedagogical methods have also been used as a way to achieve change in the schools. And here as well as in Zambia, uh, children's participation in cultural activities. Uh, this is from one of my visits at, at school there. Also there, very interesting and positive results. You should remember now that we are talking about some single schools. This is not all over in the province. That is of course what we want to achieve. But if we have the good examples, they could also then inspire others and, and spread their methodology and ways of working on how to solve the problems. So when we talk about the drug abuse, it's one school that managed to, to uh, uh, overcome that problem about, among young people. And sexual abuse is also one school, 
but the experience has been very positive and spread to others. Corporate punishment there as well as in Zambia, in South Africa even more deeply rooted than in Zambia. Um, because of uh, the violence in the past, uh, the view upon children, the view upon children is still very much as objects. They are not seen and heard. They are not talked with. They are not, uh, I mean, uh, one example was um, uh, connecting to the next point, profiling of orphans and child-headed households. Um, two principals, uh, change agents, they, they wanted to, to work um, more on their conditions. And then, to begin with, they didn't know anything about, uh, or they didn't, they, they knew very, Lim they had very limited knowledge on how many are the orphans, how are they living. So that was the first step in their uh, project. So that was an example of how children were not seen and heard or noticed in many ways. And this work on parental involvement has also been uh, successful in many ways with vegetable gardens, uh, involving parents to take part in children's homework, etc., bridging the gap between schools and homes. And provision with uh, a lot of shoes has been, have been distribu distributed, uniforms, food, etc. Also there, children's participation as an important ingredient and improvement of coordination between schools, NGOs and authorities. There are many resources around that hadn't been coordinated or used in, in the way it could be. So there are also some interesting and good experiences. So this is a, a, a principal and a student who can illustrate the changes in relationship between the principal and his students. We have experienced many, in many cases, how children have been seen and heard in new ways. Yeah, I fi finalize with this one. Uh, not from Zambia, not from South Africa. Who is this? What did you say? Is it Anam? Are you sure? Yes, it is. He, was, he has the CRC glasses on. Uh, that is something we use as a, yeah, we, we talk about it as a way of changing perspective. Uh, you, we don't have to take, yeah, should we take that one? Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We call upon Malala. Do you know Malala? Have you heard about her? Some of you have heard about Malala? Yeah, Nobel Prize winner, the Peace Prize. I think three years ago when she was just 16, the first child getting the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, she was a very brave girl who was shot in her head by the Taliban in Pakistan, close to dying. Uh, but she survived and she continued when she had recovered as an activist on children's rights, especially children's rights to education. And she said something that uh, we can keep in mind when it comes to the importance of teachers and schools and education. One child, one teacher, one book and one pen can change the world. Education is the only solution, education first. So I think most of you here in this room are teachers or within the education sector. So you could uh, keep in mind how important you are for the children you are working with or coming to work with. So, yeah, thank you very much. Toibi will continue with Indonesia. Now let me continue uh, the presentation with the Indonesian context. Um, 
as I uh, said yesterday, that um, most of the projects that we implemented in Indonesia was related to child-friendly schools or child-friendly education. That is also uh, the main theme of this uh, conference today. Um, we have been developing uh, the focus, particularly in uh, Surakarta. Formerly we have uh, our friends from Samarang, but I'm not going to talk about what uh, uh, had been uh, conducted by our friends uh, from uh, Samarang, but we are focusing on our, our friends in Surakarta. So we developed uh, the focus from thematic uh, classrooms and then authentic and realistic learning, and then participation in school management, and then later participation in disaster uh, reduction of preparedness. So this is the cycle that we are uh, uh, implementing um, our projects on uh, implementation of CRC in Surakarta. Um, this is an example of how uh, the problem that we uh, um, encountered during the implementation. This is an example what happened in Surakarta Muhammadiyah uh, Secondary School. Um, from the so-called uh, thematic uh, classroom, the thematic classroom. Uh, formerly, the classroom belongs to the students and then uh, the teachers are going to the classroom and then we change the, pro uh, the, change the situation that this classroom belongs to the teacher and then it is the students that move from one classroom to the other. And then um, the next uh, is uh, what we implemented in SD Muhammadiyah PK uh, Surakarta. Here the students can work in group or in collaborative manner and also the students um, above average will uh, help the, the younger students, their younger brothers and sisters uh, to learn, that is uh, through scaffolding. And then um, uh, one thing that uh, we implemented in uh, senior high school, senior high school. So we, we have in, in junior high school and in elementary school and also in senior high school. Uh, for senior high school, uh, we focus our attention on the students council. But as we learn that uh, in Indonesia, the school council is very different from what we uh, have in Zambia or in South Africa. In, in, in uh, Indonesia, uh, the school council is very limited uh, to the school, so we do not have any structure beyond the school. We do not have any uh, structure organization which relates one school to the other. Uh, although today we have uh, our government have developed uh, the so-called uh, child forum, child forum, but actually the child forum is uh, is uh, uh, has no structure. Something like uh, what we have. Uh, in the old days, for example, in the old days we had uh, DEMA, Dewan Mahasiswa, at the university level, that is a, a coordinate uh, organization that consists of many uh, different activities from different universities, but the, the child forum is different. So we only have a limited structure within the school. Um, among other uh, projects that uh, we try to empower in the uh, student council is the student participate in the school management by evaluating the teacher's performance. Um, well, you can imagine how, uh, how uh, difficult it is to introduce uh, the rights of the child to evaluate the teacher's performance, let alone in senior high school. When I introduced the program in this university uh, years ago, when I introduced the idea that students must have a right, the right to evaluate the teacher's performance, then um, senior lecturers were very, very angry. They, they, uh, they said that there is no such a way that students can evaluate the, the, the lecturers. But now uh, we, uh, uh, step by step, we uh, try to uh, implement the, uh, the rights of the students to evaluate the teacher's performance, and now it becomes a system. So uh, today, it has been a practice uh, in this university that at the end of the semester, each student has the right to evaluate the teacher's performance during the, the, uh, the semester. And um, when I first introduced uh, the idea in 
in the senior high school, then uh, I think you will know the answer because the answer is definitely no. No students can have the right to evaluate the teacher. And then I tried to uh, 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 implement this in, in the school. Uh, I talked to uh, the principals, we talked to uh, the teachers, somebody they are uh, reluctant to accept that. And then we tried to uh, implement that. Uh, we train the students how to uh, do the evaluation. And then finally, uh, uh, um, uh, they accepted that the students have the right to evaluate the, stu the, the teacher's performance. And, um, you know, at the beginning, we still have uh, some reluctance from different, particularly from different teachers, and particularly from male teachers, not from female teachers, from male teachers and uh, teachers of uh, science, natural science, um, 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 uh, they resisted against this kind of evaluation. Um, I think that is uh, the introductory presentation and then we will have a discussion later. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Ibu Bodil and also Pak Toibi, who has shared uh, the experience about uh, the program, how the school environment has already changed before and after yeah, the program. Now, uh, I would like to give a chance for the participants to uh, raise questions. We start from the, uh, the row on my very right side first. Are there any uh, participants who want, would like to to ask question from that side no okay from this side could you please mention your name when you mention your name please uh, uh, mention it slowly so I can uh, write down your name correctly and please mention to whom you address the question to Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thank you for moderator. My name is Ramdan Witarsa. Yeah. I come from uh, Faculty of Education Ikip Siliwangi in Cimahi, West Java. Yeah, Cimahi. Uh, my question is for all uh, the uh, present, uh, presenter. Uh, can you tell me, uh, can you tell us about how you make the evaluation? As we know, uh, Yesterday, I can see how you evaluate this program. How you evaluate this program, and as we know, teacher, as an agent, after the follow the teacher competence uh, workshop, they back to their habits. How you evaluate, and what's the the solution can you give for us? Because in West Java, uh, most of teacher. Uh, after after uh, following the workshop, they back to their habits. Mm. That's uh, all my question. Thank you. Uh, so, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah. Uh, the second question from this side. Okay, thank you for uh, this opportunity. My name is Hana Bermata Hanifa. Uh, slowly, please, your name. Hanna Permata Hanifa. Yeah. Uh, I come from Universitas Negeri Semarang. Uh, I love our focus in this session, talking about United Nations policy, children's right, and about quality education and how it goes in Zambia, South Africa, and Indonesia. But I'm asking uh, concernly in Indonesia how to make sure that the children get their right fairly actually if they were having special ability uh, let me say in indonesia they were anak dengan berkebutuhan khusus because i think in indonesia we still got some problems to providing equal or quality education for them and then um, I think inclusive schools still have any weakness that we can make it better for them. Thank you for the chance. 
So you are asking the question to Pak Toibi. Pak Toibi and maybe Ibu Endang. Okay. Terima kasih. And Ibu Sumaya, ya. Yeah. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, my name is Sumaya from UMS. My question is for Mrs. Bodil. The first is, uh, have you visited the poor area in Indonesia that the condition is like maybe Zambia's one? Yeah. Have you visited the poor areas, the poor areas in Indonesia uh, that maybe the condition is like uh, Zambia's one? Yeah. And then and my second question uh, for Mr. Taibi uh, from UMS, yeah, from UMS, uh, the project uh, from C CRC is intended uh, is uh, aim to the schools of Muhammadiyah in Surakarta. In fact. Yeah, school of Muhammadiyah in Surakarta uh, is relatively established, is relatively independent. And then my question, uh, why, why is the project not aimed to the poor area? Maybe like in Kalimantan, Sumatra, uh, Irian Jaya. <laughs> Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Ya, yeah. uh, Ibu Bodil, the one that uh, Ibu Sumaya asked, the first question is, have you ever visited the poor areas in Indonesia? Will it will the condition uh, the same with Zambia? That's her question. I think uh, the the from now on we start uh, we stop the question first. Now we give a chance for the presenters to answer the questions. Uh, the first question from Pak Ramdan Witarsaya from Cimahi. Uh, the question is: Can you tell us how uh, you conduct the evaluation after the program? Because usually. Uh, yes, the teacher can comprehend uh, the essence of the workshop, but when they return, uh, there is also possibility that will uh, the condition will still uh, the same. So, uh, how to evaluate that? Okay, we start from Ibu Endang first. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for your participation and also a very valuable question and remarkable question. Uh, back to uh, Sweden after I got the, what is it, the kind of workshop on child ride, base, school and classroom management. And then we have to think over what kind of things that I can do especially to build the project. So after I give you some, uh, what is the inside, yeah, dealing, what is a UNCRC, what is child-friendly school, what is uh, um, uh, quality education, and then you have a lot of things here in your mind. It's kind of belief, it's kind of knowledge. And then what can I do to help the children with, of course, uh, related to our capacity. Okay, so at that time, uh, something struck in my mind because you see, in regular basis, we see that uh, uh, the classroom very often very chaotic because the classroom uh, belongs to uh, the children. They write a lot of things on the table. They make a lot of dirt on the classroom, etc. And then I come up with an idea of how to change this condition by a new paradigm of changing from the classroom, the owner of the classroom, uh, the children to the owner of the classroom, uh, the teacher. 
uh, so I come up with the idea thematic classroom I talk to Bodil Bodil I've got no idea what is it thematic classroom so this is the thing that I want you to um, what is it discern after you got the knowledge the insights about what is uh, UNCRC uh, child friendly school as well as quality education and then you come up with a new idea that you can do uh, uh, in your uh, what is it institutions if you are teachers and then you can do something in your school if you are lecturer there are three aspects that you, you can do and as a lecturer we have uh, three uh, dharma duty dharma one is pendidikan education dharma two is uh, uh, public service uh, research and then dharma three or duty three is uh, public services uh, in Muhammadiyah we have Dharma 4 so Chatur Dharma Dharma 4 dealing with Muhammadiyah Kedar so this is the thing that we can do after we uh, build a project of course our projects are in Muhammadiyah schools we have about 99 uh, school partner yeah school partner so we can use all the school as our partner to do our project and of course you questions about how to monitor because you see that how to monitor how to evaluate our project you see that uh, in uh, Muhammadiyah University all the teachers have to do the three things the three duty education of course this our regular duty teaching from early in the morning until late at night <laughs> <laughs> it's of course totally different from uh, lecturers who uh, work in uh, government institution and in Muhammadiyah University of course a lot of burden hopefully we are strong enough to do that and then the second is uh, research we also can conduct research on this and then public submission this is the thing that I can do to monitor to evaluate my project regular basis yeah. so at least one semester at least one semester I visit the school yeah so uh, they are very what is it welcome yeah really welcome to us and become the real partner not just once in a while but it's on regular basis uh, we conduct the evaluation the monitor and then uh, talking to the teachers what next we can do okay. because the the question is addressed to the two presenters I would like to give a chance to Pak Tebi or Ibu Bodil to uh, maybe give also response regarding the questions about how to evaluate the program evaluating Evaluate. Okay, yeah, I, I think I talked very much about it yesterday, but the, oh, you mean how we evaluate the training program that I have been the mentor in, uh, in many different ways during years we have, have follow up, monitoring, uh, documentation, um, and I can recommend you as yesterday, were you here yesterday? Yeah, to go to this global site, Global CRC Online. There are all the reports, the books from the projects, and you can see how it has been followed up um, uh, through, yeah, through our visits, through workshops, through documentation, as carefully as we have been able to do it. And besides that, we have had an external evaluator for parts of the program. Is that okay as answer? Okay. Uh, thank you. Now let's move on to wait, the wait, second wait, question wait. from Anna. Okay, at um, I would like to give uh, a response to uh, Wihars's questions. Uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong in understanding your question. Um, <clears throat> you said earlier that um, uh, um, you know some friends colleagues, uh, teachers, invest 
uh, Java that they are trained, they have workshop in an evaluation, particularly in their own performance. But as as soon as the workshop is over, then they are back to their old tradition, their old uh, 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 behavior in the sense that um, they give little attention of uh, uh, to to their own performance. Um, um, and then uh, you try. Uh, you are asking about what uh, we did in our project uh, in order to implement the uh, rights of the child, particularly in terms of evaluating the teacher's performance. Um, of course, um, we do not uh, come to introduce the idea of evaluating the teacher's performance immediately because uh, first we have to socialize, we have to inform the child, we have to discuss about uh, the rights, uh, particularly uh, from the CRC perspective and especially from the child protection law in, in our Indonesian context. So um, we raise the awareness of the students that they have the rights they have the rights about this, about this, about this, uh, in some articles that we can find in the law, and uh, the law uh, of uh, child protection. And then um, <clears throat> we uh, have a work workshop uh, with the students uh, uh, several times. Um, we train them how to identify the possibility of their participation in schools. We begin the, the easiest one, for example, related to curricular activities. Do you, for example, do you decide yourself about what you are going to do in the curricular activities? Or uh, uh, so far you have been doing what the teachers have, have been uh, deciding for you. And then um, uh, we try to, uh, train you, to train them how to uh, set up programs uh, on, on their own. So how to, uh, how to set up uh, the plans, how to implement uh, the, uh, the plan of the activities and then how to, how to evaluate their own activities. And then later, when uh, they have been familiar with uh, setting up the programs, implementing the programs and then evaluating, and then we introduce uh, whether it is necessary, whether, um, uh, whether they think it is necessary to evaluate the teacher's performance. And then when they confirm and then we, we train them how to uh, what points they should uh, give, they should uh, concentrate uh, in, in the evaluation. And then, uh, then, then uh, when everybody in the structure, in the OSIS uh, structure, that means the, the activists, uh, is, uh, they are familiar with, with uh, um, the evaluation and then we construct the instruments together. So we assisted them how to construct uh, the instruments of the evaluating. And then they uh, conducted the evaluation themselves. So uh, after they set up the instruments and then they distribute the instruments to, to the uh, uh, fellow students and then the fellow students will fill up the forms, the instruments, and then uh, they gather again the information and then we assisted them in analyzing the, the instruments. So that is uh, what we did in uh, empowering the OSIS, the Students' Council, in um, uh, evaluating the teachers. Of course, what we find here is different from what I saw. Excuse me, Pak Toibi, mm -hmm. because okay. we have more questions to answer, uh -huh. okay. and the time flies. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, could you please very quick? Um. Okay, the second question from Ms. Hanna Pratama, correct me if I'm wrong, from UP Greece. Uh, concerning about the case in Indonesia, how do you make sure that the children's rights, especially children with special needs, get their rights? How can you make sure about that? Uh, that question is not easy to answer. How do you measure how children's rights are fulfilled? In this case, especially children with special needs. It's a big risk task for research. Uh, so I don't know if there is any research in Indonesia about that. But what has happened with implementation of the CRC in different countries is that the knowledge about children's conditions has increased a lot. 
It could be that UNICEF has that kind of evaluation or research, um, but I don't know. But I know that there are a lot of statistics about children's conditions in Indonesia. Then, I mean, very general, if you come to single schools or cities, communities, I doubt if you have any statistics. But creating statistics, getting knowledge, having research on children's conditions in relation to their rights is something where, something where we miss a lot. Uh, there is a shortage of knowledge in many areas, so I think perhaps that is a one, one way of answering the question. Could you say something more from a local perspective? Um, okay. About children with special needs, I think uh, today what we find in our country is uh, we put them in the so-called uh, inclusive uh, school. But I think um, the problem is not as simple as that because it is related to our culture, it's related to our perspective about uh, children with special needs. Um, um, in terms of culture, then we, sh uh, we should need a cultural shift a uh, uh, perspective from, for example, seeing children with special needs as uh, something like uh, uh, sickness or something as being natural. So um, uh, that they are part of uh, us, they are part of, we, we do not see from the us and them perspective, rather we see them as part of ours. Uh, that is the, f the f for the first stage, um, I think it's a time, a time consuming in terms of it needs time in order to change, to shift uh, the perspective uh, in terms of accepting the children with special uh, needs. Um, I actually uh, did not have any project uh, related to uh, the difficult or with the children's special needs, but um, um, what, from what I saw in, in, in practice that um, uh, at, at present children with special needs actually still belong to the disadvantage. They, uh, although we have the uh, inclusive school but um, they are treated, uh, they are treated uh, differently but they are not really empowered in the sense that uh, um, we think that they have uh, limitations, but we do not see that they also have potentials. Um, and then for the third questions, why not practice, uh, why not conduct it in, in uh, schools in poor uh, areas? And I think uh, you know the problems. Uh, when we are uh, stationed here in Solo and we have to conduct uh, we have to implement the projects in somewhere in Papua. You know about the price. You know um, uh, how much we ha we have to spend, even for travel only. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Now uh, the last question from Ibu Sumaya, addressed to Bodil. Uh, have you ever visited uh, any part of Indonesia, the poor areas, and uh, uh, do you think the conditions are similar to those that you found in Zambia? Uh, yeah, I don't know how to s what to say. I have, of course, a limited view of Indonesia, even if I have been here many times. But I've just been at Central Java and Jakarta. So what I've seen and not seen, but of course I have seen poor conditions. Um, uh, but if you can compare to other countries, I'm not sure. They, they, they look different. They have a, I, I haven't come deeper into it, I, I mean. Um, so I, I must, I think I should confess that I have a limited perspective in one way. Uh, but well aware of the gaps between pe people with different socio socioeconomic conditions and so on, and I have seen poverty, of course. Um, uh, but perhaps you are also thinking of how we are recruiting participants to our program and how they choose the schools they are working in. Um, we have limited resources, as you have understood. Even if we take our mouth full and talk about a global program, 
we have here in Indonesia just about 40 people who have worked together with us and we have recruited them from the same area for economical reasons, practical reasons. Uh, so, but it happened to be the most poor areas in South Africa. Um, it could, they could have chosen other schools, but uh, from them we could learn that it is possible to implement children's rights even under very poor conditions. It is possible to make changes even if the children are living in shacks and so on. So, yeah, that is what I could could answer you in a way. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, all of the uh, participants here, most of them are the presenters for the next parallel session. And uh, if you want to have more questions to the presenters, you can uh, approach them personally. I think they will be available. Pak Toibi, Bu, uh, Bu, <laughs> Bu Endang, and Bu Bodil. Because Excuse me, uh, one word. One yeah. word. Uh, please, I encourage you to visit uh, the global CRC online platform and then try to find out uh, what is provided there, including the reports on different projects, uh, including from Indonesia. And if, if, if you want to uh, go to uh, other countries, for example, in Zambia and South Africa, like what we uh, discussed uh, about, then I think uh, you will have a better perspective, you will have a better picture about um, uh, how to implement the CRC in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now let's give applause for the, all the presenters. And that's the end of our uh, keynote speaker session. Now I would like to give a time to the moderator. Uh, Ibu uh, Okta Herawati, time yours. Thank you very much, Bapak Toibi, Ibu Bodil, and Ibu Endang. So now OMS would like to give the souvenirs for Ibu Budil and Ibu Endang. Uh, for Bapak Dr. Anam Sutopo, please, to give the souvenir to Ibu Budil and Ibu Endang. Thank you very much, Papa Anam. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the morning break, and also there will be a dance performance by PGSD. Uh, I'm sorry, it's PAUD FK OMS students. Please enjoy the traditional dance performance. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It was very lovely performance indeed. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa syukurillah wa nikmatillah ila khala wa la akhwata ila billah. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We have reach the hand of our second international conference on child friendly education this morning and i think it is a sad task because we should be bidding farewell to friends and associates however it is also a privilege and an honor to be interested with such an undertaking at the gathering such as I mean, and people from different parts of the world in the field of government, academia, media, and some others. As with all such event, and this seminar has been an outstanding example, our mind have been assailed by a moment of ideas, informations, statistics, interpretations, and visions. And it will probably be a day or two before we can sift through them all consolidated our own personal perspective. There is indeed plenty of reflex upon and if this is any way enhances of our individual and collective contributions to meeting the global challenges. Then the seminar can truly be adjusted a success. As we have heard of for the past two days, there are some ideas about CRC implementations. The challenge reminds that of child rights to participation, we should still improve children's participation and encourage them to speak out what they need. I am sure we have benefited in some way from this international seminar. Numerous positions and point of view have been outlined and many messages have been delivered covering the ideas of child rights from different perspective. Finally, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of you all, I should like to thank the Excellencies, the ambassadors of Sweden, especially the beauty of political issues and child rights. Our special guest from Lund University is Budil, and also the committee, SIDA, and maybe we cannot mention one by one. And all of the other speakers and parallel members and all participants. The present has been invaluable and without any doubt has helped make this event to be a great success. We greatly appreciate the support that we have received from the member of the media in covering our activities. It is very important that the views expressed here are disseminated to a wider readership and audience. And clearly, this task has been in very capable hands. 
We are also grateful to all those who have been involved in this organization of this event. Special thanks also for the committee who have worked hard to conduct this seminar or this international seminar. And please apologize us and also sorry for everything that make from the inconvenience. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since the ICCI is a biannual event, we look forward to seeing you again in 2020 when we should reconvene discuss another topic theme related child right conventions and we would like to invite another speakers coming from different countries i think this is this the promise from the committee and the last by wishing alhamdulillah rabbil alamin this international conference of on child friendly education is formally closed thank you and see you in 2020 assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Dear all, still here? Tomorrow I will leave your beautiful, complex, exciting country with some very new, wonderful experiences from uh, this conference and meetings with my friends here. Uh, I'm so impressed. I'm so happy to have been some part of this event and the development here and the further development uh, what is coming next? You are incredible in what you find out on how to build network, how to arrange conferences and everything. Um, dear change agents, thank you so much for your hard job, for your contributions, still being active in different ways. Dear all other participants, I really hope that you bring further the message of CRC to where you are coming from and I wish you all the best, all of you. Good luck for the future and for your way back home. Thank you very much.